I want to say a few weeks ago, there was a time when, and if you know that you have, you have kids and you know that you know there are certain seasons in life that you go through. And right now we're in that season where our kids are scattered all over the place and uh, we try to limit the amount of activities they participate at one time quite naturally. Uh, but we all, we're, we're going a couple of nights a week and things are happening. They, they want to be involved in everything, uh, but we know you can't do that. Uh, but typically, we are, we're normally out a couple of nights a week, and quite naturally, we have to stop and, and pick up something to eat on our way home because it's, it's late in the evening. And so we were driving home a few weeks ago, and one of the boys, they all yell out different places they want to eat. And it goes by a vote, you know, who, who yelled first and who yelled the loudest. And, and you, you go through this whole process of, of, of trying to find where they want to eat. And once we go one place, that's where everybody lands. And so during that process, one of them wanted to go to this particular restaurant. And so we get there and we go through the drive through And as they're placing their order, uh, quite naturally, one of the items, the lady come over the intercom and she says, sorry, uh, sir, but that item is not available. Okay, that, that, that periodically happens. Well, a few weeks later, we, we drive in and we go through the drive through They want to go to this particular place. Uh, we get through the drive through We place the order. Everybody makes their request, and so we start to place the order, and she comes on the microphone, and she says, Sir, you can finish the conversation. What, what does she say? That item is, no long, is not available. Okay, all right, one time, two times, and so a few weeks later, my, for some reason, I guess my children are glutton for punishment, so they want to go back to the same place. So we get to this place. No, I, I take that back. They want to go. And then the moment they are about to say where we're going, there's a three-year-old little girl voice yell, No! They never have anything you order. <laughs> the three-year-old picked up on something prophetic. And so... Quite sure they wanted to go. They get there, one of the items is not available. I'm like, do you have anything that is on the menu? You know, as we go through that. And I begin to think about that for a moment. That in life, all of us, no matter what stage we are, we all experience some level of uncertainty. I don't care who you are, I don't care what stage you're at. Whether you're a three-year-old or you're 103, there's a level of uncertainty that we all go through. And there are moments that we experience and we wonder what God is doing. I want you to turn your attention to Hebrews chapter 11. And we all know this particular text as heroes of the faith. That God used these men and women to do miraculous exploits through the kingdom of God. That he displayed his power, he displayed his compassion and his faithfulness in their lives. But as we look at this moment, I want to take a different perspective to let us see the significance. And as we go through uncertainty in life, regardless of that level, that the hand of God has an ability to guide us through those uncertainties. If you would, let's pray together. Lord, we come before you this morning and we pray for our time together today. Lord, let our hearts be open to your word. Let our minds be engaged to your spirit. And let our lives be encouraged through what you desire to do in those moments of uncertainty. And we thank you for all these things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we look at moments, we look at seasons of uncertainty. In Hebrews chapter 11, it gives us a backdrop of what God does in those moments. 
And as we look at Hebrews chapter 11, verse 23, and it says, by faith, when he was born, by faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden for three months by his parents because they saw he was a beautiful child and they were not afraid of the king's edict. By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to endure ill treatment with the people of God rather than to enjoy the passing pleasure of sin. And so we see here what God is doing through Moses. Typically, that's where the story always begins. But I want us to take a, a, a different perspective and a look at the way God has the ability to orchestrate our lives. We see here that Moses is in a position, his parents are faced with a dilemma. They're faced with a decision on what shall they do because of the law that Pharaoh had displayed. And as we look back, Pharaoh had decided that it was illegal for Hebrews to give birth to children, particularly males. And so if you were born a male, the king gave an edict that said they should be thrown in the Nile River because he had placed in his heart that if males would be birthed, they would rise up and ultimately take over the nation. And so they found themselves in this position to where, what do you do? As a parent, how do you respond to that when you're faced with that decision? Well, while Moses is given birth, his parents decide that they were going to take their chances. His mom was the name Jochebed and her husband, whose name was Amram. They decided that we are not going to give in to fear of what man is trying to place upon us. That God had placed a burden upon their heart that Moses was going to be an extraordinary man to do great exploits for the kingdom of God. And while they find themselves in this position, they take this step of faith. And despite being told that you need to throw your child in the Nile River, Jacobed decides in this tough moment to hide their son. And as I was thinking about that this moment, they said that they put him in a basket and this basket, as you can imagine, any parent that is here this morning, it would be unimaginable for you to take your three-year-old child and throw it away. I'm reminded of that, of anybody who have had children, I take pleasure in observing people. And I notice when a person first has a child, do you see how cautious that parent is? They run, they, the, the baby is about to fall. Oh, no, no, no. Oh, get up, baby. You know, they, they running around. The second time, it's a little different. The third time, you get the oldest sibling to go help. By the fourth child, you just hope that they don't just die. You know, you just hope they're going to be okay. They go be, every time they develop, there's, there seems to be a little less caution that you have. And so as I think about that for a moment, Jacobad gets to this place. Can you imagine what is going through her mind when she is about to put this three-month-old child in a basket? She's probably wondering, as I release him into the Nile River, first of all, will it top over? Will it be able to go down the stream the way that I'd intended it? Will somebody be able to come and, and rescue him? Will the, the torrential rain or the, the, the flow of the water, 
Will it make him topple over? Will crocodiles, will, will animals get to come and take his life? This parent has all of these thoughts going through their mind. But she does something unthinkable. She releases it. And she puts it into the water and says, God, my son is in your hand. And I think about that this morning. And I want to come to you to declare this morning. When you are faithful in the moment, God will be faithful in the future. When you find yourself in that moment of determining what should you do when you're faithful in the moment, God is faithful in the future. I was listening to a pastor the other day share his, his story. He pastors a, a, a large church, several, several thousand people. God is using them in incredible ways. They, they reach in a city that is considered just unreached. God is using him. And he began to share this story about when he was a teenager and how he was far from God. And he found himself in a position, he got hooked on drugs and his life was just torn, it was apart. And he said, my dad was a military veteran. He said he was a strong man. He said, but I literally killed him because of the decisions that I was making. He said, but I got to the point to where God saved me, he broke the addictions off my life, he placed a calling upon my life. He began to use me in incredible ways. And he said, I had the moment and the opportunity to sit down with my dad and begin to ask him, how did he get through the pain that I put him through? He said, my, he said son, you almost killed me. He said, it was the toughest thing that I ever had to go through. He said, but I came to the point to where I said, Lord, if my son live or die, I'm releasing him. He's in your hands. And I've come to realize when you're faithful in the moment, God will be faithful in the future. And we see this. We come to this place. And it's so interesting because as Moses is released down this Nile River and all of the thoughts are going through his parents' mind, he has a sister by the name of Miriam. Thank God for older sisters if they're nice. <laughs> so as he has this older sister, she gets a perspective of what is happening with what's going on with Moses. And so she sees this basket going down the Nile River. And so she gets to this point where she comes and all of a sudden the princess, Pharaoh's daughter, goes out to pick up the basket. And she picks it up and, and Moses is in the basket. He is safe and secure, signed, sealed, and delivered. And so he's in this basket and so she sees him. And as the princess goes to pick him up, Miriam runs out and she says, I see that you have this little boy that's in this basket. I think I can find someone who can nurse him for you. And so while she says, I think that'll be a great idea, Miriam goes and finds her mother, Moses' mother, to nurse Mo Moses while he's in Pharaoh's palace. Isn't it amazing how God always has a plan? How would you like to get paid to take care of your children? And so he goes into this place and he gets picked up and, and his mother takes care of him. She takes him into her arms and he finds himself being taken care and nourished by his mom. She's making provision for him and Moses is growing up with everything that you can imagine. He is growing up with the best of everything. He once was just little Moses, now he's fresh prince of Egypt. And so he finds himself that was, that was where he is. He's, he's in Egypt. He has access to everything. All control is under his hand. But there's something that is happening in Moses' life. Moses knows that even though I'm comfortable, this is not my calling. 
Even though I'm comfortable, this is not the place that God has for me. And sometimes we try to identify our comfort with our calling. But I've come to tell you that God will place you in a place, in a position that you don't understand. He may put you in a position where you feel insecure. You may feel unqualified. You don't know. You may you feel like you're not old enough. You feel like you're not young enough. But how many know when God puts you in a place, he has a way of fulfilling his calling upon your life. He has a way of showing you what he wants to do in your life and the things that he's called you to. So we cannot go by what we know and what we feel. He puts them in this position. And so she finds herself holding on. And I've come to realize in this moment, Moses probably found himself in a position that he wasn't comfortable. Then he does the unthinkable. He see this war that is going on outside. And he goes and he takes matter into his own hands. He tries to use his own strength to do what God had called him to do. He took it out of God's hand and put it in his hand. And he goes and he kills this man and he buries him. And he thinks that no one sees what he's done. And then he goes out and everything, no one makes a word, no one says anything, and then there's two men out arguing one day. And Moses comes and stands at attention. He tells them, what are you doing? Why are you fighting against each other? You need to understand that you, you, you have a common enemy, that you need to come alongside each other and serve together and, and, and fight this battle. And one of the men makes this statement. He says, what are you going to do? Kill us like you killed that man we saw you kill the other day. And all of a sudden, Moses, the beloved, becomes Moses the betrayer. And he takes his life and everything that even though he knew that that wasn't where he was supposed to be, Moses starts running for his life. He finds himself in a position. And he finds himself on the backside of a desert. And in that desert, God meets him in the form of a burning bush. And he tells him, Moses, he says, here I am. See, Moses thought that now he was beyond the grace of God. He thought that God had no longer had any use for him, that he blew it. But in that moment, God delivers and speaks to Moses in this bush. And he reminds Moses of, he says, you are standing on holy ground. And Moses takes off his sandals and he finds himself in this position. And at 40 years old, Moses would seem to forfeit the call of God upon his life. He wasn't equipped anymore. He blew it. He lost his temper. But one thing that I do know, and one thing that I want to remind us on this morning, is that even in those moments when God seems to be silent, he's working. There is no such thing as you getting a good break or you getting lucky or it, it just happened. One thing that I've come to realize is that the things that God does in our lives, it is by the hand of God. That God has a way of showing us through the circumstances in life that even when it doesn't look like he's working, he's moving. Even when it looks like he's silent, he's speaking. And he's doing something in our lives far more than we may realize, think, or understand. But aren't you glad this morning that God has the ability to find you right where you are and speak to you right where you are and he can reveal his presence in your moments of situations, in your moments of doubt, in your moments of discouragement. God has a way of finding where you are and ministering to you exactly where you are. Amen? Amen. He shows him this. God has a purpose. Just as the way he rescued Moses out of the Nile River, he has the ability to rescue us from situations and circumstances that we may find ourselves in. And in that moment, in Matthew chapter 3, I was reflecting upon this, of how as we see the story of Jesus, 
when he gets to this place and he gets in this position where he finds himself, John the Baptist comes up on the scene and begins to give people a call to, to repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. And he comes in this position in Matthew chapter 3. And while he's there, God is, is using John. He's given him the, the, the privilege and the opportunity to bring Jesus into a place of his destiny. And Jesus gets to this place. He gets baptized by John. It says, when he was baptized, the heavens opened. And the Spirit of the Lord said, this is my son with whom I am well pleased. God got to have Jesus experience one of the most miraculous moments in the beginning of his life. And in that moment, as he faces that time where the presence of God reveals himself and makes himself known, and he hears the audible voice of God, it says in Matthew chapter 4, the very next verse, it says, and Jesus being led in the spirit into the wilderness. Isn't it interesting that some of the greatest moments that you may have for God, it turns and becomes one of the most detrimental and one of the most discouraging moments that we find ourselves in. He was in a moment to where he was on the, he was on the cloud and he found himself in the next moment he was in the valley. And, and Satan comes to him and it was interesting because he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights. Anytime you fast, you find yourself really close to God. And you're pretty upset and aggravated with people really easily. Because you're hangry. You're hungry and you're angry. So man need to get out of your way. So you're fasting. You, you, you're close to Jesus. And then the temptation comes. And he tells him, Moses, he, he tells Jesus, he says, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down. You're God, you're God's son, he's using you. If you're the son of God, throw yourself down. But Jesus makes this powerful statement that you and I have to remind ourselves of often. He comes back and he tells him, Man should not live by bread alone, but out of every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. And today, I want to tell you this, this morning, that man should not live by bread alone. Man should not live by what he sees, but man should live by what he knows. And that every word that comes, every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God, that that is the life. That is the way we live. That is the way we allow God to use us. And he goes through this repetition of trying to deceive and tempt Satan because of Jesus. Satan is tempting him. And one of the things that we see is that Satan shows that he knows the word. He begins to quote scripture to Jesus. He says, and he shall give his angels charge over you. In their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your feet against a stone. Jesus reminds him, it is written, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. And then he takes him, takes him to a high mountain and he says, this is all the kingdom of all the world. It can be yours. I will give to you if you fall down and worship me. He says, I don't want you to realize that I am not worshiping you. The same God that called me, the one that birthed me, the one that saved me, the one that filled me with the Holy Spirit is the same one that is going to keep me. He's going to protect me. He's going to provide for me. And this morning, the same God that served, that saved you, he's the same God that will give you protection. He's the same God that will give you confidence. He's the same God that will provide for you and meet every one of your needs according to his riches and glory. That is the God that we serve, is that we don't get caught up in what we see. We get, no, we get caught up and what we know. He says this, Romans 8, 28, and I'm asked to worship him if they'll make their way back. Romans 8, 28 says this, for I know that all things, everybody say all things, work together for the good of those that love him are called according to his purpose. And he's saying that's the thing that we know. That's the confidence that I have. And so while Moses is in the backdrop of the desert, God is speaking to him. He's ministering to him. He's encouraging him. Can you imagine going through 40 years of feeling like you missed the call of God upon your life? And you feel like you have blown it. You feel like you've made a mistake that is beyond repair. And God is speaking, and Moses is going through this trial period. He's going through this wilderness, and God is ministering to him. God is speaking to him. God is ministering and showing him what he's wanting to do in his life. And Moses come out of the desert at 80 years old. Before, he didn't seem 
to be qualified. Now he was ripe for what God had wanted to do. And that same thing applies to us. I was reflecting on my grandfather who passed away two years ago, right at 90, 94, 95 years old. Got an honorable discharge during World War II. During that moment, as I was reflecting upon him, looking at the obit his obituary, he had say served in the same church for 80 years. As a boy, ultimately became a time where he passed through the church, transitioned the church over to someone else, when churches were going through transitions and he spent 14 years of doing that, a carpenter, a farmer. My, my mom has 13 brothers and sisters. He said, I needed, I needed kids to work the farm. So I had kids and I, I provided, there was, there was free labor. I worked, they worked the farm, they served. And, and all of those things, and I'm thinking about it. And up until he passed away, he was serving in some capacity. And I thought about this idea of Moses at 80 years old, thinking that it was over. God had already planned that he had a 400-year plan about the children of Israel needing a deliverer. And he had 400 years on his mind. Moses was only 80. He had a plan. See, some things that you and I think about, we think about the moment, we think about the temporal. God has a plan. God has a plan for our lives that far exceed what you and I may think or imagine. That you may think that this is the season in your life and, and you're wondering what God is going to do in the next season. But here's the deal. Here's what I've come to realize is that when we are faithful in the season that we're in, God will be faithful to reveal the next season that he's called us to. And we find ourselves in this position because Hebrews 11, and I want to finalize our time together with this verse. He says this, by faith, he left Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. He persevered because he saw him who is invisible. What is the result of seeing the invisible? The result was Moses endured. Out of the harsh environment was to seem like he was neglected, he was rejected, he was disqualified. He endured. He refused to quit. He would not give up. And when he would be offered false gods, quick fixes, easy way out, Moses said, I'm not taking them. I'm not taking them. And today, aren't you glad today? He says this. And are you glad this morning that God is reminding us, that's what I will do for you. He says, I will give you the strength, the faith, and the patience to endure. He says, your unwavering obedience, dedication, commitment are the things that you need and the things that I need. God is reminding us that when you do what you, all that you can do, I'll do what you can't. And when you find yourself in a position where you believe in God for him to do something in your life, he says, if you would continue to lift me up, if you would continue to stay faithful and don't quit, if you don't become, you can become at the moment that when you become tired, when you become discouraged, when you become distraught, he says, if you will continue to endure to the end, I will be with you. I will continue to give you the ability to accomplish the plan and the purpose that I have for your life. He is saying, if you would continue to be able to go through the, the storms of life, the desert, I will continue to be with you. My presence will be with you wherever I may take you. That's why we hear about Hebrews chapter 11. 
We all know the text. Hebrews 11.1, 1, it says what? Now, faith is the things of hope for. The substance of the things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And what we will be reminded of today is that Moses, how he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king who endured, as seeing him was invisible. Do you believe that the invisible hand of God can be upon your life today? Do you believe that the invisible hand of God has protected you today? that he has kept you today, that he has watched over your family. There are some of you, you may have been in a position where you have experienced an accident, exp experienced a pain, that God, the invisible hand of God, he was upon your side. It wasn't coincidence. It wasn't something that it happened randomly. God in his sovereignty protected you and said, I had more for you to do. I placed my shield around you. I've, I've kept you even during the moments of trials and temptations. So I want to ask you this morning, in the journey of uncertainty, were you putting your certainty today in the Lord? There was, a, there was an old tale of a, a, a godly man. And he took this man, this man says, I want to experience God. I want to become a man of God. Can you help me? This man did the once unusual thing. He gave him a stick. He said, put it in the sand. And your responsibility is to water it every day. The man got a little discouraged because where he had to go to find the water, it was several miles away. So he would have to go in the evening, go find the water, bring it back at the, at the break of dawn and water a stick. Can you imagine? You get this task and say, you're going to become godly? He waters it. Waters, wait. Waters, wait. He continued to do this. His mind, he's wondering, why am I doing this ridiculous task? He does it for three years. Water waits. Water waits. He come into a place that the stick started producing leaves. It started producing leaves. He starts to get excited. It starts to produce fruit. And he's, a, he's so excited. He's seeing this, this stick that now is starting to produce fruit. The old Holy man comes and cut the fruit off and brings it into the house. And he tells all of this man's family, he says, come into the house. Come see what has happened. And he comes in and he says, come and taste the fruit of obedience. He's reminding them, how many know that you can thank the Lord for the taste of obedience today? That you can thank God for people who endured. That we can thank God for the wilderness moments that have triumphed in their lives. That we can thank God that we see God in the most unlikely places today. I'm going to ask you to stand with me this morning. This basket here. This represents some things that God is saying, I need you to release. Just like Jochebed, she got to this place, she needed to release it. That was the most difficult moment in her life, but that's where the breakthrough came. She released it. Today, God is saying there are some things that you need to put in this basket. There are some things that you need to put, some decisions that need to be made that you need to put in this basket. The Bible is saying there are some children today, grandchildren, that you need to put in this basket. Because there are some, my heart goes out to children and grandchildren who don't serve the Lord. Because I know Mine are obedient. They listen to everything that I say right now. That may not always be the case. 
So I want to sow as much seed as I can into those who are not serving the Lord, who children are not serving the Lord, who, grandpa who, who grandchildren are not serving the Lord. Because I want to sow as much seed of faith into you and encouragement into you because mine is going to come one day when they have to make a decision for God. And today you are in the position that you need to put some things in the basket and you need to release it. So as the worship team begin to sing, I just want you to make your way and say, God, I release this to you today. We're going to make this an altar and give you the ability. Moses saw the glory of the Lord and it sustained him in those moments. And the glory of the Lord can sustain you as you're waiting for God to deliver on the promise. When we're faithful in the moment, God will be faithful in the future.